All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast, episode 195. It's been a busy week. Yes. We've been at the Open, and this is our summary of the week. It's quite a flat start. Okay, should we start again? Keep it going, keep it rolling, but restart it now, everyone's listening to how you do it properly. All right. Come on. All right, guys, welcome yeah. back to the Rich Shields Golf Show podcast. I'm your host, Rich Shields. Welcome to episode 195. I'm here with co-host Guy. How are you doing, Guy? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I uh, We had a great week. The best week of the year. Um, forget the Masters. It's all about the Open. Don't come on to the Open. I saw someone tweet you actually say they don't give the Open enough love, and your response was quite good. What was it? I've been 11 years in a row. I've, I have been to the Open 11 years in a row. I am a huge advocate of the Open. Mm. Is it actually 11 years? Did you go to Muirfield 2013? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Lived in 2012? Yeah. Birkdale 17, I saw you. Yeah. What I bought was 16. I don't know. Troon. Were you at Troon? Yeah. St. Andrew's 15, you were there? Yeah. Yeah, fair news. Yeah, I've been... I, Hadjown's a liar, but you're not actually after were, all. I can't remember the one before 13. Which one was the 12. one? 12. <laughs> 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 was, well, them, I think 12. Anyway, I looked last night. So yeah, 11 years. And I'll tell you what I did last night. I, I was a bit went down a bit of a YouTube wormhole. There was a full... On the YouTube... On the open YouTube channel... There is coverage of the full day from like 2006 Open yeah. at, when Tiger won at Royal Liverpool. So I watched quite a lot of that. So yeah. I wanted to see how it changed. Like, how how do the crowd look? What's the infrastructure Lack look of like? Phones. Everything's turned from green to blue, which I kind of forgot happened. Mm. You know, all the Open grandstands and, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, then I also watched highlights of when Rory McIlroy won at Royal Liverpool in yep. 2014. Again, weirdly, that seemed not that long ago, but also seems ages ago. Yeah, like when you look at the crowd and you look at the fashion, it doesn't actually seem that long ago. Like Ricky Fowler and uh, Rory McIlroy were in the final group, and it was a really nice kind of calm day. But again, you look at the infrastructure, and it's like how much it's changed now. Just coming off the back of being to the 2023 Open at Royal Liverpool um, with shout out. And, and he's getting a bit of stick online and I don't like it. Shout out to Brian Harmon. What yep. what a winner. What a dominating performance. I can understand why fans are frustrated because it wasn't more dramatic. Mm-hmm. But I mean, come on. If He's not going to go, all right, guys, I'll... I'll chuck in a little triple bogey here just to make it fun for you guys watching at home. He was unmatched. He was um, just uncatchable. Yeah, look, I was thinking this last night. When you, if, if you watch boxing, for example, and it goes to the judges, it can happen where actually the winner doesn't get the win. That makes sense because the judges can be uh, dodgy. Uh, in football, you could be... Uh, awarded a penalty that you score that isn't really a penalty or you know you can be well, almost cheated well, out many, of a win many, well many times in a football match you can be the better team and lose yeah um, and like I said boxing may be the best example of that there was a fight a little while ago uh, oh what's his name now it's going to slip my mind um, doesn't matter Mike what, Tyson no <laughs> Chris Eubank <laughs> no what's he called he's going to really annoy me um, I can't remember but there's a guy that basically won a fight but actually didn't get the win right. that makes sense and it went down horrendous on social media and stuff. What I'm getting to in a roundabout way, in golf, it's simple. The person that shoots the best score wins the tournament. It's, it's undisputable, isn't it? It is. And I think the reason a lot of people weren't overwhelmed with Brian Harmon winning was twofold. I think, firstly, it was a name that didn't excite people. And he also won by so many shots, six shots in the end, that the final round felt quite flat yeah if he wasn't in the tournament there would have been a really good race for first place it was more like a race for second place in the end i did a tweet on um, i think it was saturday that didn't go down too well with some people it was a bit of a joke and i put if brian Harmon wants to win a major i'd have no issues with him winning the uspga but not the open <laughs> i'm right on cue here's your drink rick thank you ed's bringing you where what have you gone with oh what's he got me look at this thanks ed there was a day when Rick would get his own drinks, not anymore. <laughs> After the week he's had. Look at that, a couple of sweeteners. <laughs> Thanks, pal. <laughs> so if you listen to the podcast, you need to tune into the video version. You'll see Rick getting weighted on hand look. and foot. It does look really good. Well done, Ed. 
Okay. Yeah, so it was, um, it was, but yeah, he wasn't the winner that people would necessarily have expected the, uh, going into the Open, but he was world number 26. Much higher than I expected him yeah, to be. Yeah, he's now world number 10. It's crazy, the jump. So he's not like one of these Todd Hamilton or Ben Curtis that was a complete and utter left field. He's a guy that gets a lot of top 10 finishes that is obviously a great golfer. You know, it, it, this win reminds me of currently, and I might be I might be wrong in saying this, because people have proven wrong. Like, when Scotty Scheffler won the Masters, everyone's like, Scotty Scheffler? Mm-hmm. What the hell? He's, he's not... Obviously, he went an unbelievable streak before winning the Masters, but it seemed like a bit of an unexpected winner to some degree. Take that with a pinch of salt. Like, he wasn't the, the, he wasn't the household name that everyone knows him as now, mm-hmm. did they? Brian Harmon's been a lot around for a long, long time. Yep. And, you know, it, it, certainly if you walked into the Open, most majority of golfers, left-handed, fairly short in stature, you'd go, that's Brian Harmon. Mm-hmm. Like, he's quite noticeable. You recognise him straight away. What this win reminds me of currently, and I'm gonna, I'll be happily to be proven wrong, it feels like when Mike Weir won the Masters mm-hmm. and the fellow left-hander, it was a bit like, oh, yeah, kind of, I kind of know Mike Weir. Kind of, yeah, okay, yeah, he's won the Masters, but it's like he didn't really do anything after that massively. And I'm not sure if that if that is that's what Brian Harmon's going to do. Is it going to massively push him on to become a multiple major winner moving forward? I don't know. Um, I mean, his performance genuinely, when you actually look at his performance this week. He was outstanding. Incredible. He's one of those dominating performances in golf. It really was. And I think this is, you know, I think we've had a couple of days. We're a little bit late to the podcast. We've had a couple of days to reflect on it, to digest. And I was thinking to myself, what what do I want from major winner? And ultimately, I think it's one or two things. Well, it's a, a couple of things, really. It's either somebody who is a dominant force, i.e. a John Rahm, a Rory, a Scotty Scheffler, who is that top, top elite golfer to, to get that major. Or it's somebody like a Tommy Fleetwood, a Tony Finau, someone that's been around for a while, kind of knocking at the door, and to finally get over the line and get one, I think I'd love to see. Or the other thing I'd love to see is a really cool story of like a fairy tale story of a guy who qualifies. Michael Block. And, yeah, Michael Block, or if, you know Matthew Jordan, which we'll come on to shortly, I'm sure. Something like that. I think Brian Harmon was kind of just a bit of a nothing story. And that sometimes just comes down to not knowing enough about the player. If Brian Harmon had featured on Full Swing on Netflix and had a cool story, yeah. and got a bit more... It was Joel Darman. Exactly, you start won. to get to know him. So it's, it's Although it is a personal thing in the sense that you don't know him, it's not an actual personal no, thing. It's not, it's not, I don't, nobody, I'm sure nobody dislikes Brian Harmon. No. Like... It's just that he's maybe not the most likable. Yeah, but he's it? not dislike. Well, no. the, he's had some dislike for his poaching, his hunting. Yes. Um, it's a funny one, that. I'm not super... I don't really have an opinion on that either way. I know it's riled a lot of people up. Um, but apparently, the things he shoots to kill, he eats. Okay. So I think if you eat meat, how can you have such a strong opinion about him doing that? Yeah, I suppose so. I think if uh, it's trophy hunting, that's a different story. I don't fully know the ins and outs of it. So if it's trophy hunting, that that's quite bad. It'd be an interesting uh, if he did win the Masters, the Masters dinner the next year. Fresh elk, he shot himself. A bit of roadkill. Mm. <laughs> bit of squirrel. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, is it, if genuinely, if you change that name of Brian Harmon this week and and you just swapped the golfer, all the shots were exactly the same, and that was John Rahm. Oh, it, you'd be like, what? a dominating performance. He didn't put a foot Correct. wrong. He is the best player in the world. Or if Scotty Scheffler did it, or if Rory did it, or if any of the real big household names, no laying up, I listened to him on the way home one day, they kind of summarised it in one word, and I thought it was quite clever. And we, we, I always think we struggle with this. It's almost you want that thoroughbred mm-hmm. golfer to win. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like that thoroughbred, that, that real household that deserves to win it. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? But that's not how golf works. In the Open, there's 150 golfers out there playing the best they can possibly play. In some degree, every single one of them has a chance of winning. They can all post outrageous numbers. Um, and last week, it was Brian Harmon's time. But don't you think, though, with any sport, and certainly with golf, you're watching the golf to see which golfer can get the golf ball in the hole in the least amount of shots, yeah. in its most simple form. But we're not just watching for that, are we? We're watching for the sub-narrative, the story, the, the players that we like to follow. And think about Rory McIlroy, for example. He has become now a household name. You've kind of, he's a similar age to me. I think I've grown up with him. You feel like, to a degree, you know him. 
to, to a point, don't you? You could almost stop him in the street and have a conversation with him. And same with Tommy Fleetwood. Obviously, we've filmed with Tommy, so we kind of do know him. You know him obviously quite well. You feel, again, like you, you want him to win, not just for his golf, but from an actual personality standpoint. And same with Tony Finau, huge Tony Finau fan. It's just the fact that you don't know him, but like you said, off his golf alone, the way he dominated down that stretch, and you know, you've played there several times, again, we'll come on to in this in this podcast, I've played there a few times now, There's some tough holes, 16, 17 and 18 are not easy Mate, holes. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really difficult golf course. And he just owned it and just played them almost with ease. In those conditions. And, and you know what I knew as well, on the last when he got out of that bunker, I just knew he'd hold that yeah, putt. He didn't he did. need, he could have five putted, he didn't need to, he just knocked it straight in with this big massive stable putter that it's got. That That's probably is one of his most l- loose shots all week, his third shot into 18. Yeah. But, and he found a bunker and he yeah. got up and down. Yeah, he, it was just really, really, really good. Um, and then Royal Liverpool as a venue. It was insane. I love it. It's, re- it's really, really grown on me. It really has. I think um, if you go and play this golf course any time of year and there's no grandstands, I'd be. I'd expect most people to kind of go, hmm, it's okay. The more you play it, it's an absolute grower. It re- honestly, it's it's phenomenal. I was very, very fortunate to yesterday, the day after the Open Championship, I got to play the golf course yes. with open pins. Not every single back tee, but most of them, yep. in fairness. It's unbelievably hard golf mm-hmm. course. Like, And we had a beautiful day. It was sunny. There was a little bit of breeze, but nothing crazy. Got a little bit windy towards the back end of the round. Um, just You've got to be a shot shaper. Yeah, you've got to be able to shape it. Certainly, around some of those holes on the back nine, where yep. you've got to try and hold the fairway. And, and if the wind's off the left, it's such a hard shot to try and hit. I think the par threes are really, really, really good. They've really grown on me. Well, absolutely, um, the three par threes out there. Every single one of them, you have to find the putting surface. Sorry, it's four par threes. The um, sixth, the ninth, the thirteenth, and the seventeenth. Every single one of them, you have to hit and yep. hold the putting green, because they're all upside down saucepans and they all fall off uh, which either which way. Um, 17th, I th- I think it's a phenomenal hole. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think it's a phenomenal hole. So I spent a bit of time, we've obviously, again, we've played it, but I spent a bit of time on the grandstand behind, right behind the 17th tee. And this is going to sound a silly thing to say now, I'm going to say it. If you hit a good tee shot, it's an easy hole. Yeah. Now you can say that about any hole, I guess. If you hit a bad shot, it's one of the hardest holes in the world. You know why I don't think it's as hard as other par threes? I think it's I think it's challenging, don't get me wrong. But you can't actually see that much trouble off the tee. Mm-hmm. You can see the big bunker at the front. Yeah. But you think, well, that that's like having a water hazard at the front of the green. As long as I strike it well enough, I should get over that. You don't see the bunker on the right. No. Which is huge you don't see the bunker left you don't see the trouble you just see a flag a silhouette often of a, of a flag on top of a hill and you get a number and you just hit it at that yeah and i think also the length of it if it was any longer another 10 15 20 yards longer it would be oh yeah if you're hitting five six irons it's impossible i think the other way it would have been impossible and we didn't see this this year this is why i do think they will make alterations that hole it would surprise me if they didn't this open was green mm-hmm. it was the Greens were moisture. It was taking a ball. If, if, imagine if that place was as hard as this table, yeah. which it has been. 2006 Open when Tiger won it. I watched the highlights, as I mentioned earlier. It was burnt out brown. Yeah. Like, that that hole could have been unplayable if it was like that. Yeah, well, that hole obviously wasn't there then. It was, was it three years ago it got built, or two, yeah. three years ago. And the only thing as well is, I know the members play off a bit more of a forward tee, but I can imagine some members hating that hole. Because if you're fitting it into those, those bunkers, and then you're just not getting out the bunker. I don't know if they've got a local rule where they could just drop it somewhere else. Yeah, I'm surprised so. if there is. But I think as well as obviously that the main story of Brian Harmon... This open, which I think might go down of one of the more forgettable opens, potentially because of the winner. I've seen a few questions that we'll come on to later on off the podcast group about that. But there were some other very exciting stories. Again, Tommy Fleetwood was kind of so close, but yeah, so, so far so away. So wanting him to win. Um, I, I, w- I genuinely woke up on Saturday morning with this like, like real, almost like nervousness mm. about me. Like this excited kind of like, come on, Tommy. This is it. Like you're there, you're in the hunt. I don't know if he was tied with the lead or very close after de- after two days. 
obviously he's tied with the lead after day one. I think he was maybe a shot or I two. I think he fell behind after, after two, yeah. And I was like, come on, this is it. You can do this. Go out and shoot a 62, a 63, which he's capable of doing. We've seen that before. John Rahm did. John Rahm went and did it. I was like, come on, go and dominate it. And I was like, it was like the day of a really, really huge sporting event. Like, mm-hmm. I know it is the open, and it sounds like a stupid thing, but like, it felt like. I couldn't settle all Saturday and then the weather was horrendous in the morning. He teed off and just didn't get it going. He couldn't buy a putt. Put he in. couldn't buy a putt. And you know what? Again, going back, we, we were we were lucky to play golf on the golf course yesterday and we actually played a fun video for Seb on Golf's channel uh, who we played Augusta with earlier in the year. It's quite. I think we've played two major tournament courses the days after. It's all right for some. <laughs> so we did a... Uh, a fun video where we tried to play as a scramble. Me, Seb, Pete Finch, and Clubface UK does some great stuff on TikTok and Instagram. We actually played a scramble, pretending we were Cam Young trying to catch up with Brian Harmon. It couldn't hold a bean. You couldn't. None of us. No. And we hit but good ports. Just the greens are just, they're almost too flat. Yeah. Like you almost <laughs> have to hit perfect straight puts but all you, the time. But do you think though with this that, and we'll come on to Rory in a moment, but Tommy in particular, will he be leaving feeling happy that he's, again, put himself somewhat in contention? I say somewhat because of how far away it ended up being with the dominance of Harmon, but he was in that mix, if you like. Or does he leave it thinking, you know, that was a chance for me. It was a local golf course. absolutely gutted. Mm. Gutted. And how it finished for him, unfortunately, on 17 and then making triple on 17 and finishing outside the top 10. I think he'll be absolutely gutted well the other guy who you know may or may not be feeling gutted is is rory and obviously this is the, the place where rory won in 2014 it's gonna be 10 years now he's not on a major four and the little stat I mean, it's nothing crazy this but it kind of actually i put it on twitter again yesterday was that yeah you know you can say 10 years that rory last won a major and you kind of gloss over that and we know he's due one in that last 10 years brooks kepka's won five majors spieth has won three JT has won two, Rams won two, Marikawa's won two, DJ's won two, and obviously Scotty Scheffler's won one, and there's a load of guys, you Fitzpatrick, etc., have won one. But what I'm, the whole point of that stat, what really kind of got me thinking was, again, imagine if someone said to you that year, at Royal Liverpool last year or whatever, that Rory's not going to... I don't know if he... Did he win one after that? Did he win the US PJ after that, did he? Or was it the... the Open 14 was the last one, was it? No, no but he was... I, don't, I can't remember what he actually won. Let me have to get this up before I get it wrong. So in 14, he won... The, the Open and the PGA. And the PGA was... Yes, the PGA was after the Open. Because oh, we that was when the PGA yeah, was in August. in August. So, yeah, essentially, it was, he won his third major out of the four in the July. And in the August, he obviously won the US PGA. If somebody said to you then... Well, imagine what the odds would be if you were bet on. He wouldn't win one for 10 years. And that, within that time, Brooks Kepka would win five. Speed would within win that three. time, Brian Harmon would win, <laughs> that's the would thing, win a but, major. You know, I, I'm a huge Rory advocate. I think he's a great player. I love watching him play. He's probably the, the guy I get most excited to watch. Uh, again, being on site this week as you were, he is the pull. He He's the closest thing we've got to Tiger. He is without even a shadow of a doubt, the crowd flocked towards yeah. Rory more than anybody else in the whole of the, in, the the event. And I think that's twofold now. Well, threefold, I think. He's such an impressive golfer to watch in person. He has a huge fan base. I think also people know that how long it's been since he last won a major. They want to be part of history. You know, to be there if and when he finally can get his hands on a claret jug or a green jacket. But this is what we've said this countless times before, and it's going to be a narrative, unfortunately, until he wins one again. Will he win one? Like, you've, you've got to say, yes, surely he will. But will he? I know. I don't, yeah, he will. But, <laughs> and I agree with you, but, but, but I, I why thought, will he? I thought this week was his possible best chance. Mm-hmm. It, it, not forever, not forever. He's had un- unbelievable chances. But I thought going into this Open after winning the Scottish Open, yeah. I feel like actually winning that Scottish Open, he was actually going to come into this week so full of like energy and excitement and, and confidence mm-hmm. that he would just dominate. He just never quite got it going. Um, but what's mad, he never quite got it going. I don't know where he finished in the leaderboard. Was he Was he, he definitely top 10, um, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. He was, I think he was fifth, was he? Let's have a quick look. But, like, how mad is that that he can still, you know, to hit him, what well, doesn't have his A game? Tied six. 
he's he's always in top ten, well, knocking at the door. So if you look at this, then this year he missed the cut of the Masters. He got tied seven in the PGA, second in the US Open, tied six in the Open, and then last year he was second in the Masters, eight at the PGA, tied five at US Open, and then third at the Open. So. He's knocking on the door. For most golfers, that's a bloody amazing year. Well, it is. but And I think sometimes, again, I've said this before, and I said this to my brother when he was at the Open with me this week. I think when you are a player like Rory, you can almost become a victim of your own success because you're up there so much because you're such a consistent player. It can often be deemed that you don't win enough. But then other guys that might, like Justin Rose, for example, missed the cut. No one's going, oh my God, Justin Rose missed the cut. It goes under the radar. Yeah. If Rory misses the cut, it becomes headline news. So... I don't know. I'd love, I'd absolutely love to see him win one. But every year that goes by, every four majors that go by, that gets and, harder and, and harder. And they seem to be going by quicker. Yeah. Because they go April, May, June, July. It's four months a year now. Which, yeah. which by the way, I think's wrong. Really? Yeah. I like it. I don't like how they're so close. Are you right when they're over? Now they're all gone, I'm gutted, but I love the excitement that it's each month there's another one coming. I just feel like they should space them out a little bit more, at least get into August. I don't think the Open should be the last major of the year. What about the idea I've had then? So, we have the four majors in a row, so it's Masters, US PGA, US Open, Open, right? Those four months. August, the month before the Ryder Cup on the years we have the Ryder Cup, we have the Golden Crown. The four major winners have a tournament. The problem is someone's going to mess that up each year. Why? They might win multiple well, majors. Well, there's three then, or there's two. Or if it's if you win the Grand Slam, you just <laughs> you get the Golden it. Crown automatically. And they go and play, um, where could it be? The old course, potentially? I don't know, somewhere iconic. Four ball, 18 holes, the winner gets a Golden Crown. And they have to wear that for the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. But, what, but again, though, and we've said this before, but... When you look at the, the elite number of golfers there are now, there's such a strong stable. The World Golf Rankings, you've got Scotty Scheffler, Rory, John Rahm, Patrick Cantlay, Victor Hovland, uh, Xander Schauffele, Max Homer, Cameron Smith, Fitzpatrick, now Harmon, Spieth. There's, there's all these names go on and on. If I said to you that next year I've got a crystal ball, Victor's going to win one, Xander Schauffele's going to win one, and Rahm and Scotty Scheffler. Yeah. Like, so... <laughs> And then if you said, oh, yeah, Cameron Smith will win again, yeah. Max Homer, Fitzpatrick. Cameron Young. Yeah. Like anyone, any any single one of them. So it's just, and that's why I think now, and I, I feel gutted to say this, and I am always missing Tiger, and I hope he comes back. But I feel so excited for each major now that I'm not thinking, well, I never once this week thought, I wish Tiger was here. Like, I, I did wish I he was. Did. did. Did you actually? Yeah, no, I did, genuinely. I didn't once think that. Yeah, there was a few times this, this year that kind of, Maybe since once, I don't know. It, I I wasn't maybe getting wrapped up enough in the Rory fan brigade, mm -hmm. like Rory a lot. I just felt like there was something missing this open. Mm. I just felt like there needed to be another sub narrative. Yeah, I feel like there needed to be a a, a tiger or I don't know even even a legend bowing out or. You know, I, I don't know. It just felt like it was missing a bit of a narrative. Um, I mean, I'd take any opportunity in the whole world to watch Tiger again, compete and play and play in the Open, whatever it may be. And hopefully he will do and, and does do and wins. <laughs> and you, Brian, if a man called Brian can win the Open, a man called Tiger can win multiple more. Correct. <laughs> however, however, I don't want to see Tiger back personally. Unless he's actually competitive, I don't think he will be. I think we we we've said this before. Uh, yeah. Like when we when he was making his tenth comeback, it was like, but we want to see him be Tiger. He was Tiger. He will always be Tiger and do Tiger things. Um, but a question then for you: Do you think the fact that Brian Harmon won and the best part of his game was hitting it straight and rolling putts in? Does that give you more confidence that Tiger could come back and I mean. win one? Because Brian's Tiger's, not the longest in the field. He's 110 man old club head speed, are similar to us. Wow. I'm sure he's longer than us because obviously it's, it's so much more efficient, but he's not a big beast. He rolls putts in for fun. Tiger is arguably the best putter to have lived. Tiger's the best player in period under pressure who, if he has a lead, he isn't losing that lead. I think that show it, it shows a lot. Certainly on his links course is like that, the way it was set up and the conditions. It's not a bombers. That's what I mean. I, I don't... It, 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 there was a lot of talk about it being a strategy golf course mm -hmm. and there's no one better in the game to have that strategy. And I think, to some degree, I think that's where a lot of players struggled this week. 
I don't mm-hmm. think they used the brain enough. I think there was a lot, a lot of wayward tee shots, a lot out of position. Mm-hmm. Far too many golfers, in my opinion, going for like the 18th green in two mm. and finding those three bunkers at the front of the green. Yeah. Like, they can make birdie. They should have been laying it up to 50, 60 yards. It wasn't like the, the greens were burnt out and you couldn't get spin. It just really surprised me the strategy that a few of the golfers used this I week. I think the bunkers this week were brilliant. They were literally a drop shot. I think the day one, they were a little bit too brutal. Mm-hmm. Didn't they change them after that, though? Yeah, so I. I spoke to someone from Royal Liverpool, some, someone very, very high up, and they'd apparently warned the RNA that this might happen. And the RNA said, no, it, it should be fine. But basically, the, the, the sand and the lead edge was too much of an like, angle. Yeah, it's like flat almost. Yeah, the ball, if it went in, it, it would nestle up against the face. You need a face. bit of a slow, slope. It just needed a little bit. So if it hit the face, it would at least have a chance of rolling back somewhere near the middle. But I, I, I The bunkers have... were brilliant. I, I want to see, you know, we have this thing now about the clubs are getting too good, the balls are going too long, do we need to roll back the ball, et cetera, et cetera. If you, when I was a junior golfer and I was didn't have much strength and didn't quite understand how to get out of bunkers, like a lot of amateur golfers have, a bunker is a penalty. Yeah, big time. For tall pros now, if you're in a greenside bunker, it's actually often better than being in the rough. Is. If you go in a fairway bunker, they're hitting iron out and probably getting on the green anyway. So it's not really that important. It's not a big deal if you go in a bunker. I, I loved it. I yeah. absolutely loved it. It was mu- the only thing I I would say was a bit. I don't, I, I love the steep faces. Yeah, I don't mind that one bit because that for me is part of bunker. You've got to be skilled enough to be able to get that elevation. Where I did just find it a little bit too unfair is because obviously there's so rounded pot bunkers mm-hmm. that when the ball did really nestle up against the side and they literally had no shot. Yeah. that that's the, I don't know how you could avoid that. Really, I, I know how you can. Don't go in the bunker. <laughs> <laughs> The other, the last though, you, you said that you missed the Tiger sub narrative, and I do understand that. But you know, one of the really, really cool stories of the week, which I'm, I'm guessing most people obviously are aware of, though, but was the Matthew Jordan story. Oh, so so good. he's been a member of the golf club since he was seven years old, I believe. It's his home golf club. He's played Walker Cup. He's now on tour. He's a great player. He qualified for the Open via qualifying, which I think must have been a lot of pressure to try and get in. Just a bit. Because this old, with Sergio yeah. in the final qualifying at West Langs. Well, he would have known for the last, was it five or six years ago, the Open would have got announced there, maybe, I can't remember. But he would have known for that long that this was one he wants to play, he has to play. He got in. I know. I, I, you know what I said to somebody, I, some of my friends, I said, I reckon he'll have a great first round and he'll probably have a shock a second. I just had this feeling that he'll have, he'll, he'll, that would happen. Not that I wanted that to happen. He actually had great, Four days. Four really good rounds of golf. Tied 10th. Gets him into the Open next year Love at Troon. The reception he, he got when he went into the clubhouse. Because he qualified. So when I caddied for my mate, John Beasley, at St. Andrews Links, he qualified then. Yeah. Final qualifying to play at St. Andrews. So he's done St. Andrews now, Royal Liverpool, and now Royal Troon next year. Um, but but what a story. I mean, the golf club, I know the golf club are super proud. One, one morning last week, I was very honoured to have breakfast with the captain and lady captain of Royal Liverpool, which was which was amazing. I was in the in the clubhouse watching the guys on the putting green, chatting to the captains of the year. You know, the history of Royal Liverpool is fascinating. Mm. Like it's really, really it's so interesting the history of the whole place. I could do a whole two hour podcast just on that. But as I was there and I was chatting to him about Matty Jordan, they were so you could see it in their eyes. They were just so proud of him. He's such a, a wonderful professional. Mm-hmm. You know, he he's always seems to be really well-mannered. He's well-spoken. He speaks great in front of the media. From what you see, like, he's great with, with the fans and the kids. Like, you saw the amount of support he had from locals. I mean, how the hell? And this is where they're just cut from a different cloth. And I, I don't think I'll ever understand their, man, their mentality. To have that much pressure at your home open and to get into top 10. Yeah. I mean, what? How how good are these guys? <laughs> like, it is actually and, a joke. And on that as well, I know that we, since we've spoke about Liv quite a lot in the last, obviously, couple of years or year or so, and we've mentioned how, you know, we don't massively want to, you don't like how much golf is becoming out money and stuff, which I understand. But the other great thing about the finish for Matthew Jordan was it's, it's really helped him out career-wise. I mean, he won... Um, 276,000 euros. Brilliant. So that's helped him out for the year I've massively. Got no issues with him winning money. Uh, make it as, but not what? I don't know, and I'm sure I'll be able to find it in two two clicks of a button. I don't actually know how much Brian Harmon won. Mm-hmm. It's and an I, afterthought. And I, and I don't care. The Claret Jug is what he's won. He won the Claret Jug. The gold jug. medal. He won the champion golf of the year. He is now an open champion, a major winner. 
pay, I'm sure a lot of these guys, I'm sure, say this on behalf of them, <laughs> would go, don't worry about the money. Mm. I don't. But, so the winner, but like, yeah, but that it's not it's not why they're doing it. No. It's not so. Um, yeah, it was it was amazing. Matty Jordan did brilliant. Yeah, I think overall there was a lot of really really strong takeaways from this open. It isn't the most memorable in the world, um, but I think it, it again it's it's that's what the open is. The open is for every golfer from around the world to compete. And at the end of the day, Brian played the best golf. I will stop you in your tracks, though, on that, because although for most people it won't be the most memorable in the world, for me it will be, because I took my baby daughter. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Um, yeah, so we're going to come on to this. We had a, So not only did we obviously watch the golf, we were there for the full week. I did Monday through to Friday, had Saturday at home, then went on Sunday. You were there Monday to Saturday. And Sunday to Saturday. Sunday to Saturday. You did some really great stuff um, at the MasterCard, one club kind of tent where you interviewed some insane names yeah you had i'll try and read off the ones i can do you tell me where i've lost victor cam young um shane lowry tom watson sam burns is that it yes yeah and they were good really good you did a good job you shocked me thanks <laughs> thanks mate. yeah it was in front of a live audience i don't actually how many were in there a couple hundred i'd say hundred. so a few hundred yeah um i, I sh- my, the shane i mean chatting to all of them a Max Homer. Yes. Chatting to all of them were brilliant. I love chatting to Victor. I think he's such so, a yeah. cool, cool character. Just straight after the interview, I grabbed him by the scuff of the neck and said, are we doing a 10-shot challenge or what? And he went, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> and he, and he, he flicked me off and said... Well, did he? <laughs> <laughs> didn't see that. <laughs> flicked me off. Oh, right, sorry. And said, uh, yes... So that's that's in the pipeline. Guess who surprised me the most out of the people that you interviewed in terms of how much I actually enjoyed the interview and how they came across? I not surprise you the yeah, most. Yeah, there was one that surprised me. And I might be right, you might be surprised at the fact that I'm surprised. The one that then I can only think of is is um, Cam Young. No. But, Shane Lowry. Oh, right. Well, I'm not surprised that that was a, such a good one. Sorry, okay then. That's what I'm, I'm, I didn't know I would come across. I, I sometimes got the impression of him. I know he's an Irish guy and he's quite bubbly, but I kind of got the impression he might be quite serious. And oh, he, I couldn't I, have been I further. I couldn't have been more knew. wrong. I already knew before. Oh, he, he, was was my, he was my most chilled He was you. brilliant. He was really, really good. And that's the kind of thing that for those couple of hundred people that were there or that have watched it online since or whatever... That is how you build fans it because is. you see that personality. I will now be cheering for him more than ever would have been before because I feel like I, I almost know him a little bit through that. Yeah, no, I thought he was he was amazing. Um, they all were. It, it's so interesting getting their insights to link. Certainly the Americans like mm-hmm. Max, Sam, and and, um, and Cam Young. Like th- this is kind of new territory for them, and you know how they. I mean, Cam Young. By the way, what an open. Um, performance he's had so far yes second at st andrews and did he come third or or fourth um, in the end? did he fall back a little I bit think last he fell day? Back a little bit but what an open i mean he's going to be an open champion for sure his game just love is it. so good love his swing um and then getting the huge honor of chatting to tom watson again i mean i've, I've very fortunate now i am quite literally on first name terms with tom watson <laughs> um you know he, he's such a nice guy Does he call you rick or ricky I think or he, Richard. Depends how many bevies we've yeah. had. No, I don't think he drinks. Um, he calls me Rick. I, when the first time I've met him at St. Andrews when we did that video reverse, and I, I, I went up there and said, hi, Mr. Watson. I'm, and he went, don't Lord. call me Mr. I'm Tom. Um, I could genuinely, I don't know if you saw it on stage, I'm so captivated by what he's saying. Mm-hmm. Like, I literally just, I just ask him a question and, and just off he goes. And I'm I'm like a, well, I am a fan, but I'm, I almost forget, oh God, I've got to ask him a follow-up question in a minute because he just goes into such incredible depth. The start that I didn't know until yesterday or when I interviewed him, shall I say, he won five Opens in a nine-year stretch. Just looking at that then. I knew he'd won five. <laughs> I didn't know. So it was 1975 was his first and 1983 was his last. Imagine that dominance. I mean... So put it this way, right? Let's <laughs> make, make this simple for us. Imagine if somebody won the Open in 2015. So the winner was Jordan Spieth. The tw- no, the winner 2015 was... Was it Louis? L- no, it was Zach Johnson. Yeah. Imagine if Zach Johnson won it then, and then won it this year, and in between them was a three. So from 2015, 
five times. I mean, it's mad. He must have been going into every single open just going, yeah, I'll just win another one. That's sometimes what I hate about not being alive in certain generations yeah. that I don't, we've said this before about the Seve stuff. I don't, I obviously I respect Seve because I know he was a legend, but I didn't see it with my own eyes. I didn't see Tom Watson. Imagine having a player like I that know. in your lifetime. We were obviously lucky we saw Tiger, which is the, the probably the best one to see. But even that, I feel, is a little bit too young we, in parts. We did miss a huge dominant there was lots of dominant golfers in mm. even in jack's era oh, yeah and considering jack dominated so much you then still had tom watson greg norman nick faldo trevino <laughs> like you know i'm sure i've probably missed it Arnie, guys like, all those guys that Gary Player. Earlier, yeah like what i mean it's just sensational so yeah that was really 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 fun but anyway so you took you just took quickly little... though speaking of stats one thing before that what surprised me is that speaking of Max Homer, this is his first top 10 in a major. I know. It's insane, that, I know. isn't it? So he's, what, he's won six times on the he's PJ Tour. He's won a lot of times. He's won six PJ Tour events, and this is his first top 10 in a major. He went on to talk about it, how basically he's just been putting too much pressure on that himself. That makes sense. And, and he's, he's elevating the majors too much, basically. Yeah. Which is, I understand how that would happen. The, it, 100%. Yeah. Because you don't play it as a just normal event. You can't. Well, you have to, but you can't. So did you... Seven month old baby enjoyed the open. Yes, yeah, so what I was gonna come on to, and this is something a bit of a praise actually that to the to the RNA and to the open for the fact that you can go to the open and spend a day there in many different capacities. So I was there for several days and I had four different vibes. Okay. I'm gonna reel them off here one by one. You went as guy, you went as guy son, you went as daddy guy. The daddy. Uh, no, but we had a work vibe, didn't we? So we went in a work capacity and had some meetings with some people and that was very exciting and some good stuff to come. And and the Open's a great place for that kind of networking and meeting. There's some quieter places, there's some nice like, kind of little bars or you can go for like a coffee. So that that's something that you can definitely do at the Open. And everyone you? in the world of golf is there. Correct. So it's a great place to meet. Um, I also then on one of the days met with my brother and my dad and had a bit of a kind of a family-ish day, but a bit like the three of us walking around quite serious into our golf, looking at certain stuff, watching certain shots, sat on a grandstand and being a bit more like a kind of an authentic a golf, golf fan. fan. Yeah, you can imagine us wearing golf shoes, etc. Yeah. I then went, this was the bit more peculiar day, on the Friday, some of my friends were going, four with of my the mates, boys. Yes, four the of my lads. friends were going. They got the train at half seven. They were on the first pint about half past ten. They were on the source, right? Um, they got very drunk, and they, they, I didn't. I was driving. Um, they got very drunk, and if you want to go to the golf and get drunk, you can go to the golf and get drunk. There was a big Loch Lomond whiskey kind of tent. Oh, I say tent, that's not justice. What would you call it? Well, for the building, yeah, village, a temporary building. Um, where you could buy all the drinks other than whiskey, and they were on the gin and tonic. They got really drunk. Um, I was winding them up by saying out of the four of them, who was the hardest, who was the softest, ranking them in order of one to four. They were getting almost fighting about who. Well, I'd have you. These are 30 year old blokes with kids, by the way. Um, we decided that Brinksy's number four. Oh, so he's the go. softest, Brinksy. So, so just put that out there. Listen. He, he will do now. So right. he came out as Great. the softest. Uh, we all agreed that he was the softest. Right. And he was getting like quite wound up at this. Like 32 year old bloke. Like was. Pathetic. I'd have been throwing, um, been throwing haymakers yeah, at this point. But it was funny. It's funny when you're with your mates, you've got back to school kids, don't you? Yeah. Like we literally turned into school children. But then the more serious day, I went on the Sunday with my wife and my baby daughter, who was seven months old, as you know. It was an experience. But you were brave. I was brave. I don't think I would have taken No. But I understand why you did. It was on our doorstep. Well, it really she is obviously won't corner. remember it. It was more of a memory for us. We got a nice picture. And you know what? This is again why I want to shout the RNA. It's actually a lot better than you think taking a baby. There was actually changing facilities. There was like a feeding area. Um, it was really good. Went to the MasterCard tent for a bit. We got looked after and there, which was nice. It was something that was hard work, but I'm glad we did it. And it's just, just I thought I'd mention it, the fact that you can definitely go to an open in lots of different capacities. You can take kids. You can go on the ale and get sourced up if you want. It's a good day out for anyone, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And, and just on, on top of that, I'm not sure if this was an experience you encountered this week, but you can actually also go as like entertaining guests or mm. clients or, you know, I, I was very, well, we both were very fortunate to go into the MasterCard hospitality mm -hmm. and up there it's fine dining, it's beautiful cutlery, it's nice TVs, it's nice wine, it's, you know, and you've got up there, you've got businesses who are taking 
partners, wives, yeah. um, you know, having having a lovely civilised meal while the golf is on the balcony outside, while you watch it on TV, and they're all very dressed up very nicely, you know. So there are so many different ways you can go to an Open without, without question. What I'm interested about on each of those days, and you can summarise mm-hmm. it fairly quickly, how much percentage of golf did you watch those days? So that's the problem. Mm-hmm. Business day? None. Family day? With my dad, quite a, a bit. 80%? Mm, yeah. Lads day? 20%. I'm impressed it's 20%. <laughs> Family day with the kid and... 20% again. We yeah. were changing nappies. But that's the only thing, actually, I spoke to a few people that came up that watched the videos and stuff. Everyone had a great day. I think you can't not... If you like golf, you can't not have a great day at the Open. However, if you've never been before, be aware, you don't watch that much golf. No. If you go to football, you watch the football. Unless you blink and miss a goal, you watch the action. <laughs> Same for a, a boxing fight or whatever. Most sports, cricket or whatever. The only one I can put similar, I'd imagine, would be F1. Because if you go to F1, you're probably going yeah. more for the vibe, and aren't darts. you? Yeah, I suppose dart, but you kind of go, you could, in theory, watch the darts on the big... Yeah, but yeah, it's probably a good shout. Or but cricket. We- or horse racing. Horse racing is another one. I feel like, yeah, I feel I like... With horse racing, you you go almost knowing you're going for the betting and the boozing rather yeah. than actually watching the horse, I'd imagine. With golf, people go thinking, I'm going to watch golf. And you have to make the choice, don't you? Do you sit in a grandstand? Do you follow a group? Do you kind of... I don't know. The best way I would think would be to follow a not a particularly well-known name all the way around. You know where I, I would, if I was genuinely just going all day, I'd park myself in the first tee grandstand... Mm-hmm. get the best seat you can possibly get and just sit there all day and just at least you've watched every golfer hit the opening tee shots or likewise go and sit on the 18th grandstand and watch them all finish we yeah. we, we did that on one of the days where we sat on the grandstand and watched uh there was like a really nice kind of pedigree groups that were coming through three or four groups with like rory john ram victor Ovland, loads of really good players and uh, we sat there and watched them all play the 18th but yeah you've got to you've got to really commit yourself to making a decision to watch the golf i love <clears throat> nothing more than being there and being present and soaking in the atmosphere and maybe you know you just happen to be walking over the fairway when another you know one of the crossings when a green a, a group's on the green mm-hmm. and you're watching that but i just like to be fair i understand why a lot of people do it having a few drinks watching it on the tv like just being there yeah it, it, it's got a real a really good atmosphere you can't believe how many tvs are on site showing the golf even though you're there yeah because you can't see everything it's no. over too much of a space i definitely recommend anyone listening who's not been to the open who can go go i think this is a really good time a couple of weeks ago we missed an opportunity mm-hmm. okay the live podcast yeah which i do on my own i was ill because you bailed on me I have to, oh you have to bleep that sam do you have to bleep the stuff yeah sorry <laughs> <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> wrote it down. I tell. I think it's a good time to then ask you, and I'll, I'll also chip in on this. We went to live a few weeks ago, live mm-hmm. London, yeah, and now we've been to the Open. Yes, okay. I'd like to first. Is there a one liner that you had like to summarize live on, or a couple little paragraph, a little paragraph, and then also how do you see it varying from the Open? So the first thing you have to caveat that with is that obviously the Open's a major championship and lives not. So that's the first thing that there's going to be difference in stature and size. I had a good think about Live after we went. I've been twice now. I've been to London both years. If you're going to Live with your friends for a day out, I would tell you you're going to have a good time. So the the guy that went with his boys yes, to the Open, going to have a great time. That's to Live. That's, that's who you take to Live. I'd also, to be honest with you, I'd also think you could do any four of those ones. I think you could go for a work meeting. You could go with your family to watch Authentic Golf. You could go on the Lash. And you could also take a baby. So I think you could do all four. I definitely think it's more catered for the guys that want to have a party, though. I also think you can get much, much closer to some big, big names than you can, obviously, at the Open, or even probably a DP World event. And there's probably going to be better names there than at a DP World event. The real takeaway for me, and I'm going to stand by this now, I feel like in some ways I've had opinions on living, in some ways I've sat on the fence, and I've, I've finally, finally come up with something that I'm going to stand by. For me... The team element is nonsense. And I was thinking this for a while, and I would have said this on the podcast if I was here. When you support, I'm going to use football for the example, because it's probably the best in the UK to use. You typically support a football team because either of where you live or where your parents basically tell you to support. So for me, that's Liverpool. For you, that's Man United. And you grow up supporting that team. And they were obviously created hundreds of years ago, 150 years ago, whatever. And you feel a connection to that team. And in that time, 
the ground might change, the kits will change, the players will change, the manager will play, but there's something about that team that you've bought into. With Liv and these teams, they are quite literally, I suppose, like all teams, but they're just made up. They come from nowhere. So you're on the range, and we're on the range watching these guys warm up, and that's great. You've got Sergio, you've got Polter, you've got Stenson, and you've got Majestics, you've got Stingers, you've got whatever they're called, Crushers. It just feels so artificial, and I just can't buy into the whole team element at all. I think for me, it's just really... Now, with time, will that change? In, if it's still going in 40 years' time and a 10-year-old boy supports Stingers GC because his dad did and that's just who he now supports, fair enough. But I just can't envision a future where that's the case. It just feels so fake. No, I, I, I'd agree there. And, and I said on the podcast that I did, it's almost like I think some members of teams are really into it mm -hmm. and they're really trying the hardest to, to, to make it work. I think Pult is one of those, to be fair. I would say the Majestic team is probably the best at that. Yeah. I genuinely think other teams don't care no. one bit. I really don't. I think some other team members are just like, not really bothered about playing for the Stingers or the Crushers no. or whatever. I just, that's my own honest opinion. Um, where I think some of this comes from this kind of, and, and, and I know we have similar... Um, Coming from the UK, you support a team because that's where you're from. In America, there are some bizarre points of differences where, um, what's the, it'll come to me, what's the ice hockey team that moved to Vegas? Oh, I know what you mean. Or got set up in Vegas. Yeah, it's a franchise one that moved. That, that, that seems bizarre to me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. seems, Sam, do you know the name of it? What are they called? What is it's going to annoy me. Is it I thought it was ice hockey. Um, oh, God, it nearly came to me then. People w listening and watching Las from the Vegas States. Las Vegas Knights? Yeah. Las Vegas Knights were basically like... Golden create, Knights. Golden Knights, like created. And, and for me, it's like... I can't imagine people just suddenly supporting them just because they were kind of just made there. It'll take time. Other teams that I've known in America have actually moved locations. Mm. Like, they've moved states. What? Yeah. Imagine if, like, Man United moved to bloody L London. They should do. Most of the fans are there. <laughs> Set that one up. Or, like, to Dubai. Yeah. Like, it just wouldn't... It, it just wouldn't make sense. But, but even, and I agree with you, but even with that, you would you still support United. I know. So you wouldn't I, stop. No, I know. But, but yeah, you, you just, it's just this whole thing. And, and at the end of the day, everything in the world was made up. The Open was made up. And the only reason it has such significance to us now is the fact there's been 151 Opens and there's legends of old Tom Morris, Tom Watson, Tiger Woods. So we understand the importance of that. When you make an event from today... It's very hard for it to have that real significance. So, you know, it is difficult. People, UFC have done it. People see a real value in the UFC champion, and that's quite a new sport and in MMA. But I just think for golf, it's difficult. One thing I would add, though, definitely this year, I feel like the live players at the Open didn't really feel like live players Not anymore. They just felt like players. Yeah, I think you did. saw Stenson. You saw Patrick Reed, all these different guys didn't feel like live players. And I think a lot of that was to do with the coverage as well. Yeah. I think last year, well, I know for a fact, last year, they were very much like, do not cover live players unless you absolutely have to. Yeah. Like, don't make a big deal about it. Kind of don't interview them. Don't do anything. This year, they had to lean into it because obviously Cam Smith, the current Open, or the previous Open champion, is a live player, so they had to open the doors to that. Yeah, but I felt like they were doing interviews with Bryson, with Brooks, with DJ. Like it didn't feel like any live player was off, you know, um, not not allowed. And I think you know what? Huge respect to the Open mm -hmm. for their for their view on all of this. Yeah, and to be honest, to the mate, all the majors, I actually think they've had a very very clear, open minded look at this situation. Well, when you look at, actually, the live golf leaderboard at the Open, if you like, Henrik Stenson was the best. He was at minus three. Then Laurie Cantor, Louis Tyson, Richard Bland was all right. And then actually missing the cut, you had DJ miss the cut by a mile, Brandon Grace, Phil Mick, etc. But what, again, I noticed, and this is why I think it's not great having this, this separation, it was great to have those guys playing again, it was. against your Rory's. I mean, yeah, Bryson didn't have the best week, but seeing Bryson in the same field as Rory and seeing DJ and Brooks in the same field with Cameron Smith and obviously all the, the PJ Tour guys back together, if you like, 
We want to see the best players yeah. competing. I feel like they were friends again this 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 year, this week. Yeah. Like you saw John Rahm and, and Phil Mickelson, who have been great friends for many years, do a practice round together. And yeah. just like, you've not seen, we've not seen that for ages. Like, it wouldn't have surprised me if, if John Rahm had won this week. Mickel, Mickelson might have already been on, on a jet home, to be fair, but players from live pj tour you know friends of john ryan would have been present in my you know yeah. that's what would have happened um it, it was it was nicer to see from my perspective i was i was looking forward to going to the open this year after being to live recently and i was going to come back on this podcast today and, and almost tell you what i what i the difference that i mm-hmm. felt they're, they're just uncomparable yeah. they're just too totally different product i think the best thing to compare a live event would be would be a dp world event really or even pj tour event i've never been to a pj tour event um i've been to obviously a, a dp world event i do think that if you go to live you'll have a great time in terms of actually the experience i just for me it just means nothing whoever wins and whichever team it means nothing yeah, i said that on that podcast it was like i wasn't bothered where waking up on saturday morning and even sunday morning with with still this glimmer of hope that tommy for my for my own standpoint i really 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 wanted tommy to win it for me looking at it and going oh my god this could be it yeah. because it's life-changing yeah brian Harmon winning that this week it's life-changing yeah. isn't it he, know, he's going to be known as a, an open champion for the rest correct. of his life correct and i think the only way that live would have actually to me meant something would be, and it would never have happened, if they actually, when it's formed, they got number one to number four eight in the world, on the world rankings, said, right, that is now Liv, and it's literally the best players. Because then it would be, what's the best of the best? But you know that it, it, it's not that, is it, really? It's a diluted version of it. Yeah, anyway, uh, I've got a couple of emails for you, Rick. Would you like to hear a yeah. nice email? Um, so there's two contrasting emails. One's a bit long, but very, very good, and one's very, very short. And not as good, but I want to hear your opinion on both. So the first email, it's a thank you, actually. So let me just move my laptop because I want to do this one justice. Um, We've not done any emails for a while, but we've got loads of good ones. We might use some of the ones we've currently got in the next couple of episodes. But if you want your email read out, email us podcast at rickshield.com. The amount of times you get asked for the email for the podcast, it does baffle me. It's quite a simple email. It's not in the description of the podcast. I think it is, yeah. Yeah. Podcast at rickshield.com. Maybe it's people spelling the Rick Shields wrong. Yeah. Or putting the D in there. It's R I C K Y. <laughs> right, okay. So it says, thank you. It says, I'm sending this email again as I foolishly sent it during open week, which meant you guys would have been mega busy. So fool. Was, yeah, you fool. It's from Kieran. I'll say his name. It's from Kieran. I wanted to say a big thank you for sharing a great idea, which helped me to get engaged to my now fiance. Wow. She is not a golfer. In fact, she hates it. So I'm constantly looking for ways to engage her in the sport we love at my own peril. On previous episodes, you mentioned about bringing your partner along to the golf course and having um, myself play tee to green and then letting them put out. What's the name you call that, your old golf club? Oh, Fox and Rabbit. Fox and Rabbit. So she's the rabbit, he's the fox. We have been on holiday in Portugal and I managed to book the golf course where I have had my only ever hole in one. And he also decided to rent a buggy and let her do the driving, which she loved. Yeah, great idea. Using your suggestion and letting her out, she really felt included and loved spending time with me and finally admitting that golf can be fun. She also holds a six-foot par put in front of the family sitting on the villa balcony and got a standing ovation. Fast forward to the 15th tee and it's a par three where I got me only have a hole in one. I've built up the importance of this hole on the drive from the 14th green to the 15th tee and made sure she took some photos and videoed my tee shot just in case it went in again. I hit my tee shot, which sadly didn't go in the hole and asked my partner to go and fetch me another ball so I can try again. The ball I left in the buggy was planted and had written on it, will you marry me? When she picked the ball up, she saw what was written on it, and I went down on one, one knee and got a yes. I attributed this partly to you guys for the fantastic idea for including your partner. As she hadn't had, if she hadn't had a good, good time, I wouldn't have been able to propose to her on the golf course. It made it incre- incredibly special and unique that we were able to do it there. And now we have a fantastic story and another Pro V1 to put in the cabinet alongside my hole in one ball. Pictures of the occasion are below. Keep up the great work, and I'll be watching the Royal Liverpool Break 75 and the plane home. And that's from Kieran um, Mashia. Wow. That's there actually made me quite emotional. That's a nice picture. We'll put the picture in the video podcast. What a ledge. So, um, oh, that's really that's nice. Cool. 
Uh, and in stark congratulations, con- yeah, by the congratulations, way, congratulations, some Peria. Some lovely pictures. And, uh, and yes, Kieran, I, I will be best man. I, I appreciate. You. Is that what it says at the end? It does. PS. It says you can be best man. I'll be an usher. <laughs> so, um, in fact, no. It says guy, you can be our flower girl. So <laughs> that'll, that'll be uh, that'll be exciting. So we'll put that picture. Well, you've seen it now if you watch it. As long as we can come on the stag do, we're good. And then in stark contrast for that lovely long in depth email from Kieran Oak, <laughs> we've got one from Saul Phillips. This just says. The title of it is very bad at golf right now. And it says, it has come to my recognition. I've just shanked every second shot at the range. Any advice, please tell them up. Wow. <laughs> so Rick, what advice would you give to Saul? He's admitted to us. He's a massive shanker. Um, he's got the shanks. How do you get rid of the lamb shanks? Without seeing his golf swing. I know, it's quite hard. Truth be told, driving range mats are terrible for shanks. Ah. Really bad. Because the club can actually slide on, on the actual... Um, artificial grass i used to get it loads at the driving range like if not me i'd see <laughs> not me i also me i'd do it if you if you predominantly hit down on the golf ball too much the, the bottom of the club can actually slide on the on the mat and can cause the hit in the shank so dead simple tip put two golf balls together put a club between the two golf balls and then what i want you to do is try and hit the golf ball that's closest to you without hitting the other ball oh yeah just trying to get that toe strike a little bit more Nice. Uh, before we come on to some great questions, and the great questions have come from our great Facebook group, um, I want to touch on something that was arguably my highlight of the open week, as good as the open week was at the golf. Wednesday, yeah, Rick Shields and Good Good met up at Wallasey, our favourite golf course, and you put it on social media, as did the boys. Um, we thought this would be quite busy. We only promoted it Monday. Yeah, two days before. <laughs> We knew it would be busy. Honestly, now, hand on heart, it exceeded my expectations. It was insane. So, I mean, it, well, it genuinely was amazing. We we did a rough estimation of how many fans turned up. It was somewhere between 1,500 and 1,750. So yeah. around about 1,600 fans <laughs> from all over the country. Some, the- some fans had come all the way from Scotland, some had come all the way from down south, um, to come to Wallasey, which is, as Guy mentioned, one of our favourite golf courses in the whole world. Beautiful, beautiful setup. Really, really forward-thinking, cool club. Thank you to Gareth there, the general manager, for uh, allowing us access to your wonderful golf course. I might have told him only 200 people were going to turn up. Yeah. So that was... uh, Got me my laptop on set. Is it in the way, Sam? People can see your emails. So that was that was slightly uh yeah low on numbers. Yeah. Um, I think he knew as well. Yeah, we we had it was just great, you know. What what's really funny of those meetups, I get so not well nervous is the right word. Nervous and kind of like apprehensive. We've done a couple now. I did one at the Marriott a couple of, last year, um, where about seven hundred odd people turned up. This year it was definitely much, much, much bigger. It's open week, five minutes away from Royal Liverpool. We knew what we were doing. <laughs> good, good have got bigger. We've got bigger. Um, and and like, I'm nervous, man. Like it's like it's, it's like exciting. excitement, it really. Guy was on my bag. Thanks for that. No problem at all. You didn't lose. Well, you actually, I'd say you didn't lose a club. I ended up giving a club away. To yes, a I gave made you. I was forcing you to give stuff away. You gave you two iron away. I gave a hat away. Do you know what? I, te- I uh I opened my golf bag at Royal Liverpool on Monday. No golf balls. I gave loads of your balls away no as well. No golf balls. I had, yeah. to, I had to buy a box of Pro V's from the shop. Yeah, I gave the a lot of The first time I've had balls. to buy Pro V's for a long you time. You know what I've found that's really good? is first thing, spending your money and giving away your stuff. It's really enjoyable. <laughs> it's not like my wife. Um, so the um, 1,600 people turned up. We played Wheel of Not Ideal, which is a concept that the lads from Good Good do, where they have this wheel with all the different clubs on. You spin it, and whatever club it spins on, that's the club you've got to hit. Thankfully, it was a really good game. We played four holes. Um, I hit some really nice shots mixed with some very different shots, some weird shots. I think the good thing with that game is, bizarrely, without any people watching, I think you want to land on not ideal. Because if you've got a sandwich off a par 40 and then you shank it, it's kind of like, oh, it's all right. Whereas if you drive and you hook it out of bounds, it's quite embarrassing, isn't it? I I was more than happy because we spun an eight iron off the first tee. I was like, perfect. So par four was like, perfect because i could thin it a little bit and get away with it it's like oh yeah i meant to thin it i wanted <laughs> to get more distance uh but the turnout was amazing thank you everybody that, that came the video will be going on good goods channel very soon um 
It was a beautiful it evening. It was insane. Like the lighting was absolutely amazing. Um, everyone just was having a great time. Um, we pretty much played till it went dark. It was nearly 10 o'clock when we finished. Mm. Um, and then you got sourced after, didn't you? I had a few beverages. Sally sourced. Had, to be honest, I had a few beverages before, during, during and after. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And it he continued for on late on in the morning. But. No, it was it was insane. Thanks to everybody that came, as you said, it was a huge turnout. Um, and I know you've just said, but thanks to Wallace. I think what we love about Wallace is so much, and we've said this before, we'll say it again till the cows come home. Golf course, outstanding. Incredible. The fact that they get it, the forward, fa- the forward thinking, they let us use the facility to do the podcast last week as well. Awesome. The food Outrageous. is insane. The members, I was speaking to Lady Captain, you know, they get it. And that's a golf club as well, Wallace that's got an incredible heritage and history. You know, we've said this before. I keep saying we've said this before because I don't want people to think you've said that before, but I'm going to say it again. That the um, Staleford was created there. You know, they've had some amazing players come from that golf club. The fact they're willing to try new things is, is really Bob, cool. They've got this amazing picture of, Bo- is it Bobby Jones in the yeah, clubhouse? Um, but the fact that they are willing to experiment and not shy away and, and similar kind of ethos to the RNA as well. You know, the RNA is such a prestigious organisation, but the way they're willing to try things at the Open now and, have you guys on site and content creators is really cool to see. But yeah, it was a great day and it's exciting. I think we need to do more of these things moving forward. Yeah. Well, talking about that, we haven't forgot about the live podcast. Well, we had, I'd forgot, but Guy reminded us that <laughs> this podcast. Um, we have got a live podcast, which we will look into and hopefully it'll be in five weeks. You know what? Though? I'm going to put this out there now and I think people listening will get this. I'm not, let's do it as a celebration of 200, but I'm not personally upset if it's not the 200. I'd rather get it right. Okay. So let's say it ends up being 202nd or whatever. Okay. That's okay. All I think right. we'll just make sure that it's in celebration. And to be fair, in the next few weeks, there's actually a few holidays and everything we've got to take. Yeah. It's summer holidays. So, so I think it might be, it might be seven weeks down the line, but still our 100th podcast episode. 200th. 200th yeah. podcast well, episode. Yeah. But I think it's a celebration for, for everybody. We know we don't maybe say enough, but we do appreciate everyone that's listening and watching. And certainly this week, obviously you got stopped a hell of a lot at the open, which is great to see. But the people that came up to us that were saying, I will love the videos. Yeah, I love well, the you podcast. did obviously from the podcast too as well. Yeah. It was really, really nice, and we do appreciate it, and um, it's very good. So a few questions then from our Facebook group. Um, one word to sum up somebody that is on the fence about whether to join the Facebook group or not. Give them a little bit of motivation, maybe two words or three words, but in a small sentence, tell somebody why they should. Why not? <laughs> He's nailed it. <laughs> He's only gone and nailed it. <laughs> why not? It's free, like-minded individuals who share a love for golf, podcasting, bit of Rick and Guy, yeah. mainly Guy. You yeah. get a lot of love on there. Yeah, I do. It's nice. And uh, <laughs> and I also got... It's a safe space. It is. And also, somebody put a picture in there of me having a wee at Wallace Golf Club that didn't appreciate. Brilliant. But you approved it? No, 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 no. I approved a post and they commented on Clever. that. Clever. So, they didn't zoom in quite enough. <laughs> they had to zoom in a lot and I don't think they had a... <laughs> Tele, a tele lens, so it, uh, everything was okay. <laughs> didn't, have, didn't have a telescope that get, reaches to Mars. It wasn't a warm night, it was a cold night, okay? <laughs> All right, come on. Um, sorry. Right, okay, so Bobby John has said, was the Open boring this year? Yes. Okay, wow. And then he also said, Will well, it, it was. Like, there's no dispute in that. As we mentioned at the start of it, it was It was the, the right person won, but as a fan, it was boring. Okay. Um he also then said, sorry, would Rory, will Rory win a major again? Again, yes or no answer? Yes. Okay. I'm going to go no. Uh, what was the story behind the photo of Rick on the floor and Bryson shouting for? <laughs> so actually, I don't know this one. So this is, this is really saw funny. It, but I don't know the answer. I don't know what it was. So throughout the week, I was obviously presenting and doing hosting at the MasterCard tent, which, which sat along the side of the third hole. Mm-hmm. An unbelievable location. It really was. And... Um, we'd watch a bit of the golf and out the back, out the kind of fire exit out the back was possibly one of the best views of the whole venue. Really? It wasn't open for spectators, but it was like a little fire exit and they had a little balcony and you could see down the third, the tee shot and then down to the green on the third hole, mm-hmm. one of the hardest holes on the golf course. And there was fans down, down below um, and everything else. And then the guy, one of the, the volunteers from the, the tent next door, the HSB tent, spotted me. For, and he said, well, watch out, by the way. A few golf balls have been hitting the, the um, tents today. Like, Bloody hell, what the hell? Because normally you don't hit, you hit to the corner yeah. and then you pitch in. I have a funny feeling players were playing for the hospital, like the, right, okay. the tented village, because 
there's no reason to hit driver there unless you're going over the corner. Oh, yeah. And even when you're going over the corner, it's really hard. Now, the tee shot in general is quite hard to position with an iron. Because mm. if you don't quite catch it, you could easily hit it out of bounds. But with a driver, there's no possible way of hitting out of bounds unless you go way oh, too far yeah, right. Not for these boys. So I was stood on that balcony and I was chatting to this guy from HSBC and there was a few golfers and I couldn't see who was on the tee. All of a sudden, we hear this huge yelling of, of four. Okay, and I, I will verify there was huge yellings of four. Good. Okay. Started from the man himself, Bryson, which I didn't know it was him at the time, right? So I'm still on this balcony in prime view and everyone's shouting, four, four, four. And suddenly this golf ball whizzed past us. You, as far as you are to me right now, this ball whizzed past. It was still flying at tremendous speed and clattered into the side of the Mastercard tent. Wow. And went almost behind the Mastercard tent where all the, the porter mm. cabins are and the wiring and whatever else, right? And then loads of fans were like looking and they, they spotted me on the top and they were like, I was like joking, pretending I got hit and all this. And I was with Ellie from the r and at the yeah. time, which is so mad. So she's one of the head um, people behind all the media from the r and straight away she goes into work mode <laughs> she whips both her, she's got two phones she whips both of them out sticks them on record she starts filming all this i'm thinking this is brilliant so i went down the stairs because the ball was just at the bottom of the stairs so i went down the stairs just to see whose golf ball it was and it was a tight list left dash pro v1 mm-hmm. x like left dash is one of these balls yeah, yeah. that get low spin and all this i didn't know whose it was at this time so i'm laughing so i thought i'll just do a bit of a funny picture so i lied down next to it and it was funny because the Open were dead happy because I had that wa- I had the water bottle in my hand, which I was about to do like a little promo for anyway. So I li- lie down on the floor in a bit of a kind of dead position and, and took a picture. And, and obviously that was really funny. So went back up the stairs, left the ball, and everyone was like, where's the ball, where's the ball? I'm like, well, I'll just wait for the player who comes along. Only Big Bryson dog. DeChambeau. So... He's there and he's saying, where, like, where is it? And they're pointing up and he spots me on the balcony. Obviously, we've done the podcast with him and I've, I'll message him. We, we were trying to film this week, earlier in the week at Wallace. We wanted to do a 10 shot challenge, but he couldn't squeeze in 18 holes naturally because it's the open week. And he uh, he shouted, oh, hey, Rick, how close? I said, mate, it nearly took my <laughs> ear off. So I said, do you want the ball? He said, yeah. So I ran down the stairs, grabbed the ball, ran back up the stairs and tossed it down to him. And he it was right in front of us literally we we had the best view in the whole house and i honestly think the players were playing for it because then they got to drop it free drop in the in the trampled part yeah. of where all the fans were hitting from now i don't it's a bit naughty as you hit someone correct it? it is a bit naughty so i don't i'm not saying that is definitely the play yeah but the guy from HSBC, the volunteer, said a lot of people it are hitting this today. Not a driver, that is it. It's never oh. a driver on that hole. So he took a free drop and he was like 140 yards left of the pin and hit like an I-9, just missed the green left and got up and down for par. Um, but yeah, it was it was, it was was pretty epic. So. That is a funny and story. And so then I messaged him that night and I said, you, like, thanks for nearly hitting me. And he said, I did sh- I did shout four. And he said, you need to post that picture. So I, did. I wasn't going to post it, but once he said post it, and it obviously did pretty solid on Instagram. It did very well. Uh, Hugh Davis, has, uh, that question, by the way, was from Mikey Simmons. I've already his name out. Hugh Davis has said, which par three, 17th hole is more of a challenge, JCB or Royal Liverpool? And also, which is your favourite? JCB is a million times harder than Royal Liverpool. Mm. Yeah, I'd agree. And is it your favourite? JCB is my favourite. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I definitely think walking to that 17th tee at JCB every time I've done it, it does take your breath away a little oh, bit. It's so good. It's so grand and like, oh my goodness. No, you're hitting like a four. I've hit everything from a three wood to a six iron into that yeah. green. I've only parred it two or three times. So just hitting that green is an accomplishment. Yeah. The island itself, sorry. You know what's weird though, With a sounds silly this, but I was thinking the other day, a tough par three, if you play a golf course once and you come up to a tough par three, if you hit a good tee shot on that hole, you often then don't realise it's tough. No. Whereas like a tough par four, i.e. the 17th at the old course, you have to hit a couple Correct. of good Every shots. Every time. So like 17th, you've got to hit over the hotel really or just left of it. And you've got to hit the green and, and navigate around the road hole bunker in the road and then you take your two putt par. So I think you can appreciate it's a tough hole. Yeah. Whereas if you play the 17th at uh, Royal Liverpool for the first time, hit your 9-9 to middle of the green two putt, what's the loss about? I've played that hole now maybe five or six times 
and generally I've played it really, really well. I think I've only missed the green twice. Yeah. I hit one in the bunker short one time when yes. we played that was um, the first time. The first I time and I didn't get up and down. That was annoying. But I, I hit the wrong club. Like mm. that was totally on me. Since that, we played it with Robbo. Yeah. Played par then, got good up and down. Birded it in that invitational. Nearly birded it again yesterday, parred it. Like, to some degree, I think I played Sawgrass. Yeah. JCB, I think when you can see the trouble, it's much more menacing. Yeah. Like I mentioned before, when you can just see a flag silhouette on the top of the green, you don't realise there's any trouble down there. Where when you can visibly see the trouble, even if it's just out the corner of your eye, that really yeah. plays with your head a lot more. This is one that I don't quite agree with, but I want to hear your take on it from Jacob Brewer. What's with Rick's new American twang when he says damn? I know, I, I'm kind of saying it like you're damn. because of that. Yeah. yeah, it's like a joke. It's like a... I'm saying it. In an American accent. It's a, like, a damn. Yeah. Like, I'm actually doing yeah. it as an American. Yeah. Because I wouldn't normally say damn. Yeah. Go, damn. It was weird, though, when you started the other day saying, I'm going to put gas in my car, my clubs are in the trunk, I'm going to start using the sidewalk more, put that in the trash, yeah. and get in the elevator. Correct. Uh, the kids want some candy. Exactly. So I don't know. It's something tomato, more. Tomato, tomato yeah. soup. Yeah. Listen, that's how it's going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I say it on purpose. Yeah. In like a. Damn, like I'd say it on purpose in American accent. Use it in context then. How would you do it? it I normally do it, just one word after a bad shot. Okay. I'll hit a bad shot and go, damn, damn. <laughs> damn, man. Right, Jamie Holland has said, this is actually a very interesting question because what we're about to do after this podcast. What's the difference between a tightly T100 and T150 irons, forgiveness, etc.? Now, before your whole lap thought, Rick, um, you can't give too much away yet. The embargo is the 2nd of August. So everyone's seen the golf clubs, but we can't really give too much of the technology differences away. You've hit them both. What do you think? In a nutshell. I think the T150s are a very interesting club. I think the T100s are very similar to last year's T100s. Yeah. Yeah. I know you've been enjoying them in the bag at the moment. Really have, yeah. The 150, they're, um, they're more than just a bit stronger. Last year with the 100S or last iteration, they were just basically stronger version of the 100. The 150 this year are a bit more to them, yeah. and I think a lot of people will like them. Um, I'm looking forward to test. I'm yeah. literally about to review them this afternoon. Yeah, another impressive. Um, well, this one, I, I put this I put this down because it was a, it's, there's only uh, one answer to this. It's from Derek Farge. Who had more selfies taken with them at the Open, Guy or Rick? It, it was a no contest. I spent most of my time hiding. <laughs> yeah, it, no, it was a no contest. Um, it was a bit mad this year. Thank you, by the way, everyone. It, like it, but it was it was very difficult. And it sounds like I'm whinging no, or moaning. No, it's but it's you. I'm not just saying this to you now. I've said it to behind your back as well. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Like, no, but you do. I think we you naturally do speak to people in a great way because people that come up to you more often than not, they're obviously fans of the channel, they're, they're nice people. Oh, of Those they are. people that watch the channel are great. So you, you give them time and it's yeah, brilliant. It was it was crazy, but very, very much appreciated. Um, I think when I got home on Saturday night, my wife went, how was this week? And I went, <laughs> draw a picture. I'm just going to have 30 minutes yeah. and not talking if you don't mind. <laughs> The way I should respect the way that. I speak to people on the other hand is terrible, though, isn't it? Oh, is it I'm surprised I didn't get chinned. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> joking. It, the people are great. Um, and then last question from Dan Linger, who actually I used to work with at Nike, has said, "What is your favourite burger?" Because I used to eat a lot of burgers. I think it's a bit of a joke. Right. But what is your favourite burger? Talk to me. Talk to me through your favourite beef burger. Is it is it a beef burger? Is it a lamb burger? No, it's is it a chicken lamb. burger. <laughs> it's a burger. A burger burger. I've got two at the a moment. Patty. I must admit, I did have this weekend a. Double Big Mac meal. Nice. Jeez. And it nice. had five burgers on it. That's insane. They must have put, they must have put one on. Yeah, they must have I'd accidentally put another one on. Wow. Because really all they do is take a normal burger, cut it in half, and then say as a quad. They're very thin, aren't they? Very, very thin. Uh, we've got a company close to the offices called Burgerism. Oh, wow. Ugh, now, don't Burgerism. We shouldn't be getting onto this because I need to. I need unless I wanna, Burgerism I wanna health want to sponsor the podcast. Burgerism for an episode. can sponsor the whole podcast. Yeah, you know what I like about Burgerism, and this is everything. A, yeah, everything. But what I really like, not only is the burger great, the packaging that comes in is second to none. So if you're from Manchester, this is this escapes people if they're not from Manchester. In Manchester, check out Burgerism. Go on Instagram, even if you're not. Absolutely ridiculous. But I'm I'm now on the biggest health kick of my life. Wow, ever. 
Okay. The video we released with Ryan Ruffles. Yeah, Ruffles a few feathers. Unbelievable video. I yeah. genuinely think it's one of my favourites all year. We've been very fortunate. But the golf on display by Mr. Ruffles, Ryan himself, was <laughs> exceptional. Mm. However, standing next to Ryan Ruffles didn't particularly give me a great deal of confidence because he's quite a good looking, mm. quite a what in shape gentleman. Mm, he looks like your nephew. <laughs> yeah. Your so, American nephew. So that's it now. The line is drawn. No more sausage roll reviews. I feel like I've hit the desk a lot today. You have, there's a lot of tension built up. No, it's because I'm not eating. No more sausage roll reviews. That's it. Wow. That's the only thing I'm cutting out. <laughs> <laughs> so those reviews you do once every three weeks, not happening anymore. Um, so, what, yeah. What, what's the new... Um, I don't know yet. I don't. I think you go too hard and then I know short I do, term. But have a little burgers in today to no, celebrate the no, Open. No, I'm not getting burgers. <laughs> Cheers to Brian Harmon, the burger. No, I, I am. This time next year... I'll be a millionaire. I'll be a different man. So you're going for a year project? I'm going for a full open to open. But then what happened with the double burger yesterday? Was that not count? No, that was Saturday. Oh, okay. So when the Open finishes? Yeah. No, so it was when, when it, it started Monday. Right. However, so then, yesterday wasn't my great, great start. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a great start. Well, what happened yesterday? So I got to Royal Liverpool. So I didn't eat in the morning. Right, okay. Well, I'll, I'll have a light breakfast. I yeah. think it's breakfast on offer at Royal Liverpool. Okay. okay. So I got to Royal Liverpool. Yeah. Bacon bar. Mm. Okay. It's not bad. Basically a sausage roll. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted a sausage balm, but there's bacon balm. So I had the bacon balm. Pulled a bit of fat off, to be fair. Oh, nice. Pulled a bit of fat off. Yeah. Um, and had a <laughs> pint of fresh orange juice. Oh, it's a lot of sugar. No. <laughs> <laughs> a pint of fresh orange juice. God. It was nice, though. We played. We teed off at 10. Mm-hmm. We got round to the halfway house, which has never been open no, all the time. No, I've never seen time. it open It was life. open last night. Yeah. Uh, or yesterday. We just missed out the last batch of hot food. Oh, I was so going to have a sausage roll too. So what did you get instead? I had a cup of soup. It's not bad. Tomato cup of soup, which yeah, was fine. actually really, really nice. nice. But then I'm starving. Of course. So when we get in, you would have hated this. When we got, well, not hated it, but when we got in, it was soup and sandwiches. Yeah, I'd okay? hate that. Sandwiches were great. Yeah. I'd load, uh, not loads. <laughs> <laughs> I was starving though. Like proper starving. Have a guess what flavour the soup was. Um, You'd have hated it. Cauliflower and leek. Mushroom. Oh, pathetic. What, who wants mushroom soup? No. Give us tomato or I a know. bit of veg. I know. Mushroom. Did you eat that as well? No, the heck. Didn't touch it. So well I done. A, thanks. Go well, thanks. I had a pint of Guinness, which oh, is like bit a... Bit of iron. Bit of iron. And actually, I tell a lie, me and Sam played nine holes. I, I played 27 holes yesterday. Well, there you go. Walked some calories off. Yeah. But then when we got in, I had one more beverage, because yeah. I could. Yeah. And I did actually have a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> And um, was that your tea? Oh, did you have tea yeah. as well? You got no, I didn't have any tea. No crisps or anything in the house? I had two packets of crisps yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm a secret eater. You know what I got yesterday, by the way? It's a game changer. Monster Munch pickled onion, okay? You know what they taste like? Yeah. In a Walker's crisp. What? Hear me out. A Walker's crisp. That'd be quite good. It's really good. I can't have them, though. I'm on a diet. <laughs> so today I've had two bananas. <laughs> no, I am, I'm on it. Yesterday was more challenging, but today, no challenges. Just um, the thought of a burgerism. Sounds anyway, like a burgerism. Um, um, that it? Um, yeah. How long was that, Sam? Can long. you see? One hour 15. So hopefully be up today, Tuesday. So when this, people listen to this now and you'll be talking into a burgerism. I'm not after burgerism. By the time, this is, this is a landmark moment. 195th podcast mm-hmm. is when I commit to a year's worth of... And then what about the open next year? Then you'll eat junk for that week. No, I'll be a... a so it's not open to open, is it? It's just Adonis. now to ever. Adonis. Adonis. No, it's just that's the goal. That's the finish it's line. It's like a kebab shop, Adonis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there's, there's big changes need to be made. I've put timber on. And I, and you know what? The other thing, I, I need to get better at golf. My golf has really gone down. I played all right yesterday, to be fair, at Royal Liverpool, but my game has really gone downhill. Mm. My putting's amazing at the moment. Everything Maybe else. you just practice a bit. My chipping's really good. You know what? Yesterday, I played in a scramble. We had a shot from off the green, right? The three guys putted, and there was a little bowl, like a little mound to get over, and everyone was putting. It was, And I went, I'm going to chip this off a tight lie. I just dinked it over the little, nearly held it. Nice. So it's getting there. But then I also, when I played with Sam last night, I double hit one. Oh, my God. 
No cameras, no pressure, anything. Double hit shot. <laughs> Doesn't anyway. count anymore, does it? So no, it's like, fine. It nearly it got it closer. To <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. That's, uh, I feel like the end bit was a bit of a therapy you look, session. You look hungry. I'm starving. What are you going for lunch? I don't know yet. Oh, this, I think, you know what I think you need to do then is prepare. I know. Claire, my wife's away at the moment, though. <laughs> So right. Well, the start when she gets back. No, I can't. You can't start a diet when you're on the, on the other house the week. You could be having a few cans at night. No, yeah, can't. Well, a couple of pizzas. Start on Monday. This is tell everyone now, and then next podcast you can start. <laughs> Let's have a little burgerism for the lads. Come on, not not been in the office for ages. Do burgerisms happen on a Tuesday? So they happen. They happen when you when you want them to happen, <laughs> my friend. Right, guys, thanks for listening. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. Bit of a weird ending, but Ripple. peace out. We'll see you soon. Bye.